Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Center for Open Science webinar focused on an exciting initiative, the Special Education Research Accelerator. I'm Sandra Steginga. I'm faculty at the University of Utah in the Department of Special Education, and I'll be one of your two co-hosts today. We're very excited to hear more about this innovative project and initiative from the directors, as well as a key site collaborator in the project. Overall, this session is meant to be interactive. The panel will be presenting content, but we encourage participation in the chat and the Q&A of the webinar. Also, there will be time for some discussion and Q&A at the end. We hope that this time together fosters inspiration, but also collaboration and discussion as we continue to work toward advancing practices in research and open science. Uh, we encourage you to introduce yourself in the chat and let us know where you're located. And also, if you don't mind sharing what your field of study or focus is, like special education, biology, or other. And with that, I'd like to hand it off to my co-host, Dr. Charlene Kayuhara, to introduce our presenters. Yes, hi. Um, I would like to introduce our esteemed colleagues. Um, Brian Cook is a professor of special education at the University of Virginia. He is past president of Council for Exceptional Children's Division for Research, previous co-editor of the journal Behavioral Disorders, and co-director of the Special Education Research Accelerator. When he has time, Cook drives around the country in his van with his wife and two dogs. And Bill Therian is a professor of special education at University of Virginia. He is co-editor of Exceptional Children and co-director of the Special Education Research Accelerator. And I am Charlene Kuhara, Associate Professor of Special Education at the University of Utah, where I conduct act academic intervention research targeting students with high incidence disabilities. Um, and I have participated as a research partner in two SARA projects and will be co-hosting with Sandra. Thank you, Charlene and Sandra. Um, so we've got a, a fair number of slides. Uh, we may skip some of them depending on the time. Uh, we would like, uh, as as things, uh, if you have questions or, or thoughts to share, please please do so, and and we can uh, try to respond to to questions and, and have some discussions along the way. Um, but we want to um, give you a little background um, on. Uh, where the um, special education accelerator kind of the, the genesis of it where it came from um, we'll talk some about crowdsourced uh, research uh, and uh, then go into some specifics around the special education research accelerator which will um, which we call sarah um, we'll we'll take a visit to our, our website that that uh, may be our grandest accomplishment yet um, and we'll overview uh, the, some uh, current projects that that are uh, one we're just finishing up, and, and two that are in their in their early stages. Uh, and then we're going to to finish up talking about the Alethea Society, which uh, is a a broader venture that we're we're hoping to house uh, Sarah or, or the Research Accelerator uh, under. Bill, do you want to take the, the next little bit? We, sure. We, we so, didn't um, find out exactly who's taking what, so we'll, we'll come <laughs> each other off for the next little bit. Yeah, so, uh, you know, thinking about uh, crowdsourced research kind of compared to what, what is considered traditional research, really, most of the time, traditional research is what we consider kind of small science, right? So it tends to be very broad. Lots of people are answering lots of different questions, um, very either on their own or very small research teams. Uh, so broad, but shallow. So explores a lot of different questions. Uh, researchers are awarded for novel findings, and there tends to be little collaboration across research groups. Uh, and that's, I think, across a, a wide variety of fields, but particularly within the field of education and our subdiscipline of special education. So what are, what are some of the problems with this kind of traditional approach, particularly in education? Uh, one is it really results in underpowered studies with small uh, sample size. Uh, and this is problematic for a variety of reasons. And probably the biggest one is that meaningful effect size might go undetected. Um, or sometimes, you know, you're going to get spurious results and you're going to get large effect sizes that just, um, um, if they were replicated with larger sample sizes, um, would, would not be able to replicate. So this leads us to having research consumers to believe an intervention is effective or ineffective that in fact is, is the opposite. And it's really concerned with all, you know, within all applied science, but particularly in the field of special education, we're working with individuals that are already behind 
uh, in academic and social skills, it's uh, particularly problematic because we have a shortened amount of time. Um, also, a kind of a lack of transparency and openness in, in uh, reporting study procedures and results. And, and we've seen, you see a lot of these echoes in different fields, and we've certainly seen them in the field of special education. So publication bias uh, is documented across many fields, including in our own field. Also, selective outcome reporting. Uh, so non-significant findings, 30% more likely than significant findings to be excluded in published findings. Uh, and then, of course, the practices of p-hacking and harking. So really kind of trying to get those um, novel, significant findings. So researchers consciously or unconsciously kind of looking for those results using techniques called p you know, p like p-hacking and, and harking. So, and uh, Bill, do you mind uh, if I sure. cut, off, cut off each other, number one? Um, you, Bill and I have been uh, doing this for a while now, and as, as we grow longer in the tooth, I, I think it does uh, give us an opportunity to uh, reflect on our own research, uh, as well as, as the research that, that we read and, and, and edit and that we interact with in, in the field. And you, I, we do a lot of, I think, very good research in the field. But the more we thought about this in our entree, when Bill and I first started uh, working together, and um, in, in in an indirect way, it, it uh, uh, I, I guess it's a good thing. But I, I was in Hawaii at the time, and now I'm in Virginia, so uh, it it, uh, it it made me move out of paradise in some ways. But we started working together around replication and just realizing how seldom uh, replication was done. But then when we dug into it, really realizing how haphazard it was when it was done. And very often it was done in kind of name only. And, and as we started to wade into and, and, and look at the literature emerging out of psychology a decade or so ago, we started to think, what? How does this play out in education, and what are the implications of it uh, in in education? And 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 so I I was just thinking about that as Bill is is um, giving the some some of these um, specifics that uh, that that we're seeing and 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 concerned about. I think it's both a level of concern and thinking that we can do better, which will have important implications for doing better for the teachers and students that we're trying to uh, in, inform and improve services with our research. Absolutely, Brian. And that was, as he said, uh, really scarce replications. And this is a special issue that Brian and I were involved in that was published in 2016 that kind of looked at replication within our fields, kind of following other fields review of, of their literature. And, and we found very, you know, very small number of studies that were actually uh, replication studies with, with it in the field of special education. Um, we just update, we're, we're right now finishing off a review to update that. And it might have ticked up just a hair, but but barely a hair. It, it, it's still um, it, it's it's still well below one percent of the the published articles are replication studies in the field. Right, and and this is I think a result often of, of this kind of traditional research approach where researchers are being reinforced for doing novel studies. Um, you know, not just saying, "Hey, here's an, a potentially effective intervention. Why don't we work as a field to kind of modify it." and see who it's effective for and under what conditions, but instead saying, oh, let's all go out and create our own reading intervention and work with our own, you know, our own group of children that we were able to find. So we're not seeing the replication. Although, honestly, within the field of special education, uh, if you go to this 2016 special issue, you'll see there's several papers there where we kind of make the argument, while we don't call them replication, there are replicative elements of a lot of our work. So we are certainly a field that that builds on what came before, but not necessarily in a traditional uh, replication framework. Um, also, really limited diversity and generalizability of, of the funded uh, work that's uh, in our field. So the two main funding agencies for our work is the National Center for Special Education Research, which is under the arm of IES and uh, the US Department of Education and the Office of Special Education Programs. And this, this one, this first bullet point really kind of surprised me and shocked me. When you look at the work that was done 
and funded by Nixer over a roughly five year period. And these are, this is, they have different goals within IES and one is goal three and goal three are large scale random control trials. So that's what we looked at. They funded 38 of these and these are, these grants, you know, range anywhere from three to $5 million. So they're quite the investment for the U.S. And of those 38 grants, only 22 institutions uh, received those grants. Uh, with 61 of those awards going to just eight institutions. So we're seeing a very kind of narrowing down of, of who's receiving the resources in order to in order to conduct this work. Also, a real lack of diversity in the in the study samples. Uh, Sinclair conducted a, a review of uh, study populations that we published in Exceptional Children in 2018 and found oftentimes there's not reported the, the diversity of the sample, who was involved in the sample. Uh, and when it was, they tended not to be very diverse in every sense of that word. And uh, IS goal, IS broadly, so Nixer and NCR uh, funded goal three and four studies are disproportionately conducted in large schools and school districts in urban and suburban areas in the coastal region. So even the really high quality work that we're funding as a as a government tends to be limited in generalizability as far as the samples, the demographics of these individuals. They tend to be in the same parts of the country and they tend to be going to the same researchers. And this, um, you know, it seems like a real shame when you think about the capacity for the field of special education or education in general in order to conduct research. So if you think about the field as opposed to us all being individuals doing our own novel work, you think about ourselves as, as a workforce that can be harnessed to answer important questions about serving individuals with disabilities in our schools. It's, it, we're, we're pretty large, it's well over 1,500 special education faculty at R1 and R2 institutions. So those are the institutions where faculty are expected to, to engage in a high level of research. Um, and vast majority requires uh, and, and fund research at that institutional level. So we have federal funds, there's sometimes state funds, there's uh, obviously foundations as well, but universities, public universities and private universities spend a significant amount of funds to fund research that happens at their institution. So we have this large faculty base uh, uh, that we could harness just at these top research institutions. And then when you think even broader, that uh, you, there's just a significant amount of people that are receiving doctorates in education. So this is just one stat that, that we found from NSF that showed over 2,500 doctors in education awarded in 2018 alone. So, you know, we have, we have a huge workforce that could be answering these questions if we try to think about how we might conduct research differently from than a traditional approach. And I think there is in some ways uh, just everyone exploring whatever they want. I think there are some things that get attention and and maybe it, the the often discussed competitive nature of academia breeds you know, some uh, real workhorses to go out there. But I think the, the inefficiency and the lack of coordination uh, around how we conduct research, where it really is uh, every team or perhaps every, uh, every person in some way is kind of outdoing their own thing. It, th there's a lot of redundancy. There's a lot of gaps in, in how we conduct research. And we'll talk a little bit about that later. Yeah, you want to take the next couple of slides, Brian? Yeah, sure. So... Uh, Quickly here, and um, uh, again, we can always go back and fill in more, email us, because uh, within an hour, uh, we've got too much content to go through. So real quickly, just crowdsourcing, be an alternative to, to some of these issues. Um, we really like uh, the Omen et, et al. paper and um, some of their quotes or notions, but the idea of combining resources across researchers to conduct studies that just couldn't be accomplished by individual researchers or, or teams. Uh, we like that broad definition. Sometimes people say, well, so what, what separates um, when you have a, a good group of colleagues from different places doing research versus crowdsourcing? I don't know. Um, I, I don't know where there's a line between crowdsource versus getting a group of people together, but it 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 certainly there with the extremes, it's bringing all sorts of people together by different mechanisms to work on it. But I, I think crowdsourcing is just making sure 
that, that we have multiple uh, individuals, multiple research teams together, that um, the, the design of the study incorporates that and enables research that couldn't be done by individual teams and researchers. Yeah, you know, and I don't, I, it probably doesn't fit the actual definition of crowdsourcing, but one thing that I would, that I would offer that would set crowdsourcing apart from maybe getting together with a group of eight researchers, you know, is kind of breaking out of those social networks that you maybe, um, you know, the all that we have at University of Virginia or everyone who went to the University of Kansas and now they're working on the same kind of, um, you know, the same kind of research or portfolio. Ideally, crowdsourcing is uh, broader than that with opportunities that kind of break outside of the academic trees that you might be involved in that we typically seem to be to be stuck in as researchers. That's a good point, Bill. Uh, so in, instead of that vertical distribution uh, of research where one individual or one group is doing all the different steps, there's a horizontal distribution of uh, ownership resources and expertise where lots of different teams or individuals are, are working at uh, any given uh, step of the research process. The emphasis, uh, instead of trying to get as much research done as possible, fewer, larger ideally well-planned and coordinated studies uh, getting done. Um, one of the things that we were attracted to with this is we think it really facilitates systematic replication, uh, both uh, facil uh, both conducting replications of previous studies, but doing concurrent replications across uh, multiple different teams. Um, and uh, one of the things we've really become interested in, and we think that there's a lot of possibility is is thinking about how to crowdsource conceptual replications in ways to examine effect heterogeneity and thinking of of a effect heterogeneity rather than kind of a bug that we have to be uh, worried about uh, that oh no uh, the effects have been shown to to vary that that that's that that's a feature that that in in education we're going to to have effect heterogeneity across many different uh, variables and so we need to start thinking outside of the box and rather than try to pursue the effect size realize that there is a, a distribution uh, the, the, of heterogeneous uh, effects and and really try to to think about how we can. Uh, examine and, and try to explain some of that heterogeneity. And one of the things that also attracted us a lot to this was uh, the possibility of trying to democratize research. So bringing in um, large and diverse uh, groups of, of both researchers and participants on, on any given project. Yeah, and that's the one thing too, when you think about crowdsourcing, I think folks often think about crowdsourcing data collection, but really in a true crowdsourcing model and where I think democratization would come in is, is through the whole enterprise from deciding what's the important questions, you know, where the studies should be conducted, the whole process, not just data collection is, is it really the true democratization process of, of crowdsourcing, I think if it's done well. So this is one of those quotes that that we really like, um, and and boy, we've been in in the situation where, well, we can't do that. We'd like to do that, but we don't have the resources for it. And uh, I, I think one way to think about crowdsourcing is what do we really want to do? How's the best way we think we can address this? Now let's figure out how to crowdsource crowdsource those resources to to make it happen. And that idea of trying to broaden the focus from trying to find the result. To, to looking at a distribution uh, of, of results across different factors. Yeah, go ahead, Bill. Um, go ahead. Oh, I, I, I think we'll, we'll just skim over this. We just want to be clear. This stuff wasn't our, our idea. We are, we crowdsourced this idea to, so, to, to some extent. Uh, when I came to University of Virginia in 2018, we started talking to the, the folks at Center for Open Science about different things. Uh, we're at a reception uh, talking with um, David Meller and, and, and Brian Nosek, who started telling us about this psychological science accelerator and the many labs uh, work uh, or studies being done, which I didn't know anything about. And the more they told us, like afterwards, Bill and I just, this <laughs> we have to do this. This is exactly what our field needs. And I think it's such a great fit for education, 
broadly, but special education in particular, where we often have low incidence populations that we're trying to study, that it is very difficult to get just a, 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 an inadequately powered study uh, it, it, in any one uh, site or, or region. And, um, and, and fortunately, uh, some, some people at, at, at Nixer um, are, are, are agreed with that uh, sentiment. But so we really, this is modeled largely after the, the psychological science accelerator. And um, you know, I think we're doing it on a smaller scale. There are some differences between uh, education, which is uh, you know, very applied uh, intervention work um, that is, is often uh, intense intervention work, uh, that that issues of fidelity, for example, really come into play, uh, where um, maybe that's not the case in, in some of these other very large scale studies. And so part of what we're trying to do is take this model and see how it applies in, in education and special education uh, specifically. Absolutely. And if you have if you're not familiar with uh, the many lab studies, um, I highly recommend that you go and pull these studies and and read them. It's it's incredible work with large numbers of researchers across the globe, working with with uh, for instance the many lab study at fifteen thousand total participants. It's not incredible work um, that an individual researcher or even a, a researching team would never be able to accomplish throughout a lifetime career without these kind of um, accelerators and uh, approaches. So as Brian said, definitely props to the to the psych, uh, science accelerator. That certainly was a jaw dropping moment when we heard about the work that they were doing and um, the idea of bringing it into education, specifically special education. So as, as Brian said, we were fortunate enough to uh, get an unsolicited grant in order to fund the special education research accelerator. Uh, and since then, uh, we've got another another uh, yes grant, which I, I realized we neglected to put the number on here, uh, and then also an, a National Science Foundation grant as well. Trying so, to keep that second one secret for a while. Keeping a secret, yeah. So um, it's an online platform. We're going to uh, go there and just take a look at it briefly and show you around a little bit. Uh, and you know, and I, it's uh, I guess you could say it's a conceptual replication of the psychological science accelerator. I think that's a, a right way. Brian wrote that line, and I agree with it. Uh, <laughs> good, I snuck that one in on you. Yeah, it was very good, Brian. Very good. A little replication humor goes a far way with <laughs> with me. So thank you for that. All right, so um, I would lo I'd love to spend just. Uh, I'm going to stop sh sharing my screen for a second so that I can pull up the the psych accelerator and hopefully show it to you all and see if I can get this to work. All right. Did it pop up? Yep. All right. Um, so this is kind of the front page of the accelerator. Um, you know, we have we have a newsroom and a little bit of information. The main thing I kind of want to focus on is the studies aspect of it. So this is for folks that are involved. Okay. Going slow for folks that are involved in studies with us. That's going to be the main the main avenue where they're going to they're going to find studies. Okay, let me see. Is our website not working, Brian? We've never had trouble with it as far as I know, but <laughs> blame it on your internet connection. Well, I'm still on Zoom, so. Yeah. Ah, well, this will save us some time if it doesn't work. All right. So if you go, can you can you all see that? Yep. Okay, good. So this is our this is the Sarah Studies uh, area, and we'll we'll talk about these. We have these two IES grants, um, but I want to kind of focus on the Sarah Pilot Studies, and Brian's going to talk kind of more specifically about um, this this study. But what you see on this front face is um, what we provide to our research partners. So we kind of if you think about the re the research process. We kind of uh, our study dashboard follows that process. So from IRB protocol and pre-registration to data collection protocol um, and so on and so forth. So we try to make it as as straightforward as possible. Um, 
uh, embedding in YouTube videos related to, to what, what the study was, um, and then walking down the whole process from experimental design and randomization to data collection protocol to partner site tracking. And if you kind of think about how you might task analyze conducting a study, that's how we kind of try to uh, put it together. On the back end of this, and it's probably the area that we need to work on the most, uh, is the data collection activity. So we're aggregating these data from, um, obviously from a variety of different partners from across the country. Uh, we need them checked to make sure that they're correct. We need them to be um, pulled into various software. And that's that's the area where we're using a lot of um, external vendors to do that, that we hope eventually will kind of be more immersed with, with um, within the particular website. One thing that I really like about this related to this idea of crowdsourcing and even more important replication is once this study is done, uh, uh, while we're conducting the study and until we analyze the results, all this stuff is only available to those individuals that are actually implementing the intervention in the study. However, after they're done and this one's getting close, we'll go ahead and make this, pu uh, we'll publish this to the field. So this is something that folks can do to, to engage and see what we did and, and, and to replicate those work. So anything uh, specific in here you'd want me to show, Brian? No, I don't think so. Um, yeah, I don't. <laughs> We we can take requests from the audience, <laughs> um, but you could show like the the um, the the map the with the the research partner description and 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 the map and and it'll actually show the link in case anyone's interested in um, in, in uh, inquiring about it. Yeah. So here here uh, research partners, there's a there's an opportunity for. Folks to contact us. Uh, originally, Sarah, because it was an IES funded uh, project, we were keeping it within the states, but we are going, and we're going to be talking about this a little bit later. We're hoping to go international, just like the Psych Accelerator is, so we can start conducting researchers uh, across the globe. This kind of shows you where we are within the states. We've got a couple, only a couple of states that are that we're missing. So we've got a significant amount of research partners that are available to conduct crowdsource research with us and um, the rest of um, of Sarah. Nice, Bill. Thanks. See if I can get this this to show back up again. Are you seeing the PowerPoint? Yep. Awesome. All right. That's the worst part. The biggest nightmare for me related to Zoom is switching be between screens. So I feel successful at this point. Yeah. Now it, it's all downhill. From <laughs> Thank you. All right. So we want to talk a little bit more in depth related to the the studies. Brian, you want to go ahead and talk about that first one, the pilot study. That was the the uh, the part of the site that I was showing. Right. And so this was our very first. This was the the first project um, that that we undertook, and uh, we replicated a, a study published in in the nineties. We purposefully tried to. Uh, focus on something that we thought was relevant and meaningful, but was also very straightforward. This was uh, an, an RCT. Um, it was an intervention study, but the intervention was uh, very constrained um, and, and, uh, and, and could be done uh, individually. Um, and and in a, it wasn't something that was going to take weeks or months and was done in the context of, of, a, of a whole class. Um, the big thing that came out of this, and maybe long term, it was real good for us, but uh, we got this funded, I forget if it was probably 2019 when we started, um, but we got things together and were, uh, had our, were ready to go and people were uh, about to start recruiting uh, or, or, or were beginning to recruit schools in the pandemic hit. And and it uh, just really kind of threw us sideways, um, and through a couple of no cost extensions, we ended up going online and and doing uh, everything online. And so it is uh, the intervention was it, it is retention of of science facts for uh, upper elementary kids with high incidence disabilities, and uh, the intervention was using what uh, Scruggs et al. called interrogative elaboration, where in other words, you ask the kid, so 
um, uh, about animal facts. Why do you think that is? And and you and you work through a series of, of prompts about um, why that animal f- fact would be true. And so we're we're going to see in both immediate and then um, uh, over a, a longer time period if that results in in higher uh, retention. We're done with that study now. We can't decide whether we're pro- we are very proud. And but on the other hand, we're also a little disappointed. We envision this being much larger um, through the pandemic. Through it was a real struggle to get into schools in 2021 when when we were doing this, um, and so we tried to get a little creative. And our uh, ultimately, this was just a pilot, and it really was just a pilot. Um, we had a lot of initial enthusiasm, and we were very excited that wow, this is going to be a big splash for our first study. And then research partners just had to drop because even schools they had connections with, they couldn't get in and and do the research. And oftentimes when it was, it was just with a a few students. Uh, So this was a a true pilot. Uh, Results are pending. Uh, I'm very interested to see them. Our our methodologist, Vivian Wong, is is outstanding. She is uh, preparing uh, a, a multiverse analysis to talk about uh, results under uh, different assumptions and, and using different approaches. And she is writing the code independently of, of um, cleaning the data, having different people do that. So the two never meet or influence each other in any way. So we don't, we haven't like kind of run preliminary analysis yet. It's going to be all, all done at, at once. Uh, we have a, a, a colleague who is doing uh, natural language processing and using machine learning to look at fidelity, uh, which we hope to be able to develop to do that in almost real time uh, as a way to uh, look at fidelity via distance, which is a real uh, a challenge for us to, to think about. Um, and uh, ultimately, as, as Bill said, we're going to be sharing not only the materials from the study, but but the data uh, and and the results as well. So um, yeah, this uh, coming the, up, national lang- uh, the language processing, I think, is one of the most unique things that came out of this. So you know, we had there was an intervention protocol and a control protocol, uh, and uh, so we had exemplar pl- protocols, and then. Um, as as our research partners implemented the intervention with the students, those uh, audio recordings would automatically be transcribed, and then uh, machine learning to see the correlation between what they were, what we thought they should have done, and what they had done. And so it's kind of fascinating to think of treatment fidelity being instead of just being a checklist, being a correlation with an exemplar um, um, script. Uh, and so if you think about eventually we're hoping Sarah we're in hundreds of schools or hundreds of research partners and the data is coming in we can in real time transcribe those um transcripts and just and see how close they are and I think even even maybe even more interesting is for somebody who does research a lot and you go in and do treatment fidelity you check the boxes and you get 100 percent treatment fidelity but you look at different teachers or different implementers and you know there's a difference right you know there's parts that you aren't catching so you can do that reverse as well in, in an exploratory fashion where you could see who had the greatest effects and then see if there's any um, correlation or similarities between their scripts. So you can kind of backward engineer um, those kind of softer aspects of the intervention. So we think there's a lot of a lot of potential with, for natural language processing for crowdsourcing and just research in general that um, that we're hoping to see. And, and we did catch someone we had. We were we were yeah. doing this process, and uh, we caught before the person told us we we had uh, uh, and someone implemented an intervention. They were supposed to do the treatment intervention, but did the control intervention, and that popped up for us that they that it didn't match the it didn't match the protocol uh, that we were expecting it to. So, but it did match, match the control. Yet. That was the that was it didn't the, match the control. Did not match the the treatment, and and that was yeah. caught automatically. So you could see how. If we had drift or if we had someone implementing an intervention and they were supposed to be doing a different uh, intervention, we could catch that pretty quickly, even with a large group, of, uh, a large group of researchers, which we think is exciting. And we realized that when uh, Charlene was going to uh, be one of the hosts, we thought we'd take advantage of, of, of that and that she was involved in this study. She's involved in one of the, the other studies we're doing now. And so 
we asked her and, and she was uh, so kind to on very short notice to to put together just a a, a few comments and um with the make sure to include some positives, but uh, just your <laughs> experience in, in being a research partner uh, on these studies, because that's something Bill and I can kind of conjecture uh, about, but, but, you know, we don't know the, what it's like on the other side of, of, of the crowdsourcing studies. Right. Absolutely. And it's such a privilege to be here, not only co-hosting with Sandra, but to be presenting with both of you, Brian and Bill. Um, I, as a research partner, so as Brian mentioned, I can attest right to the challenges we faced in the initial pilot study for Sarah, um, you know, from a research partner perspective, getting into the schools and recruiting participants, the pandemic happened. And at that time in my area, research was pretty much shut down for, you know, into that following year. And so it was very difficult to, 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 so that was an obstacle that we faced. Um, but there are several positive takeaways that I wanted to emphasize, and we'll get to some challenges in the next slide. So as an intervention developer and researcher myself, I, you know, I, Sarah provides such a critical platform for furthering our evidence base, as Brian and Bill uh, referred to earlier, um, especially in special education when we're dealing with smaller, um, you know, populations of students with specific disabilities. Um, or abilities. And I think as research partners too, we are at an advantage in a sense that we have built relationships with, um, you know, our local school districts and LEAs. And so presenting them with an opportunity to contribute to a large scale national project um, is appealing to them on many levels, uh, primarily because of the benefits of crowdsourcing, um, you know, that, that, that was talked about earlier. So that is like the impact on schools and teachers um, are much less in terms of time spent in schools and you know effort in recruiting. Um, so it, for example, if I were to carry out a larger research project locally, I would it would require more time for me to be in schools to work with teachers and districts recruiting um, you know, participants, obtaining consent and assent and all of that. And so crowdsourcing provides a way um, um, you know, to really streamline that process, which is really appreciated, you know, when you're conducting intervention research in the schools. Um, it's also crowdsourcing, I think this type of approach to research cultivates a shared view of collaboration. And uh, Sarah presents an opportunity to work with researchers na nationwide. And that democratization piece, I think, is so critical that we need to be incorporating more of that humanity in, in the work that we do. Um, and the uh, uh, finally, the, the I think the most instrumental, I guess, takeaway for me as a research partner is that the support and resources, the infrastructure that Bill and Brian and their colleagues have built um, you know, the website and their, our ability to, to connect with them, you know, um, seamlessly if questions or problems arise has just been superb. And I think that is essential in, you know, being a research partner and carrying out this broader vision of conducting replication research. Um, so Bill, can we go to the next slide? Yes, so challenges. So um, there's only been a few challenges and I think they're mainly um, institutional challenges involving um, you know, the institutional, institutional review board or IRB requirements at our respective institutions. And I know that they vary across the state in our country in terms of um, you know, uh, what is it that we need to do in order to ensure that you know, for me being in Utah, that I'm able to uh, go into the schools and be part of this research project, even though the main umbrella IRB is coming out of, for example, University of Virginia. So there have been some um, interesting things, I think, uh, and I think it's more, um, you know, on my shoulders in terms of really thoroughly understanding what those policies are and uh, how Utah, for example, is able to work with other institutions in, as far as this goes. Um, another part would be to really make sure that you understand, I think, the scope um, and the aims of the project, because, you know, if you're collecting fidelity data or, um, you know, uh, implementing an intervention, that that, that understanding is clear. Um, and then again, I think this is... Um, this is critical, is that relying on the continued support and resources from Sarah, um, 
because issues, challenges, obstacles, problems may arise as you're conducting this out in the field. And so it's really, you know, they've been just phenomenal in, in working with us in terms of making sure that we're, um, you know, implementing the study as envisioned. So all in all, it's just been a wonderful experience. And I'm looking forward to um, continuing to work, especially uh, on this next project, um, uh, the NSF funded study that Bill is PI on. So thank you. Yeah, it's been awesome. Thanks, Thanks Cher. All right, I will go um, quickly then. So the, the Sarah 2 was the, or Sarah 1, as, as we call it, was the pilot study. Sarah 2 is, is a um, another, um, why can't I think of what, uh, unsolicited, um, grant from from Nixer and the focus on Sarah 2 which wasn't our original plan we we imagined just more scaling up but I I think the big focus of, of Sarah 2 was we started to be think more and more about exploring generalization boundaries starting to dig into uh heterogeneity of of effects and uh and, and we wanted to bring crowdsourcing into not just the the data collection but also uh, the conceptualization and the design of, of the research studies. And so we know in education that intervention effects vary across moderators, um, but, but we, we seldom systematically design an entire series of studies to, to try to systematically get at the, the generalization boundaries across those uh, moderating variables. Um, and because of that, our, our knowledge accumulation is, is typically incomplete and, and inefficient. So um, we, uh, again, picked an intervention that we thought was straightforward, that we still think, that we think is relevant and important. Uh, and so we're um, designing and then piloting a, a series of conceptual replication studies uh, around uh, the to explore the generalization boundaries of repeated reading, specifically for the outcome of, of reading fluency for uh, students with learning disabilities. And I've got um, some some graphics here to try to get our head around uh, what what we're doing in Sarah too. Um, so sometimes uh, Vivian uh, Wong and uh, well, all of us, we like to talk about we have in in our field a lot of really good studies. Uh, but maybe those can be thought of as bricks of research evidence, that we have some really strong bricks of research evidence, but oftentimes we don't integrate those into a wall of knowledge that can be actionable for uh, educators in, in to answer questions about, um, does this work for who, in what settings, and for what outcomes, not just does this work in this one study. And to do that, we need to think about you know, creating blueprints uh, to, to make sure that these bricks of evidence can be assembled into walls of knowledge. I should just leave it there, uh, but not, not really, but that, that's a nice image. How to do that's a little messier. So this is just an example. This is from our proposal. Um, and, uh, and and so there are lots of different potential moderator variables that you can, they could be dichotomous, they could be multiple variables. And so just imagine there are multiple sites or regions. There are different types of classrooms that, that we could um, in, implement a repeated reading with. There could be different uh, types of personnel, uh, teachers, assistants, teachers, parents, but there's, and this is just hypothetical here for a, a heuristic to to try to display what we're talking about. But let's say there's two main types of personnel we're interested in, um, kids with and without reading disabilities. And maybe we think that there's an effect of time. So we're looking at, at a different cohorts. Uh, and, and so we could theoretically imagine this grid of, of effect sizes across all the different combinations of these um, effect moderators that, that we've uh, prioritized or, or, or think are important. Go ahead. So then, and this is the part where I will beg off and and not uh, then say you need to, to email Vivian if you want to talk to her, but she has what I consider kind of methodological voodoo, that, but she has many different ways to be uh, strategic, essentially, about selecting uh, different uh, studies to, this is a grid of 64, 
And so we're not going to, in any given project, be able to bite off 64. This is an example that I think is, is probably awfully optimistic that we could bite off 16. But if we're going to be able to do 16, let's be systematic and make sure that different combinations of variables are represented. And, and so we're not just doing studies that are predominantly, uh, or, or that we have some variables that we don't know anything about. And so this is is one uh, configuration of, of that. And so then we would go and, and go ahead and do these. I, a blue is positive effects, the size of the square, and this is all hypothetical uh, just uh, to, to as, for illustrative purposes. But but we would have actual empirically derived effects here, um, and and from those, because they were strategically selected, we can then estimate the effect sizes in all of the remaining um, cells in in the grid, and so we think the the process of of identifying these variables, laying out this grid uh, from experts in a particular area would be beneficial for the field just to have, even if we don't do all of the studies, uh, but because we could then estimate effect sizes, but this could be doc students, colleagues in the field who are interested in the area, rather than try to justify a study on their own and, and pick something, they could be guided by, uh, well, we don't have anything in this, uh, this particular cell. I should do a study on that. And over time, we get better and more precise, empirically derived estimates of all these cells, which better enables us to, to estimate um, the, the effects in, in other areas. But hopefully, you start to see uh, some patterns across this where you can actually kind of get this uh, surface area of effects where um, you, you start to understand effect heterogeneity and see that it works, uh, that, that effect sizes are dampened or heightened depending on the presence of these different moderator variables. So that's our big, <laughs> that, that, that's our big direction for, for this uh, SARA 2. But again, we're just piloting this. And right now we're in our very first step where we have a core consensus panel of uh, six d diverse experts in repeated reading, and uh, we're we're they're coming to, to Charlottesville next month, and we're going to sit down and take a first stab at uh, identifying the moderator variables and developing a, 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 a an effect grid and um, an integrated uh, research design to to explore that, and then we'll pilot. Um, uh, doing some of those studies and then do it on a larger scale. We we um, plan to to do a replication um, uh, to to apply for uh, for a grant in the IES replication competition to do it on a larger scale. I think that's it for Sarah too, Bill. Yep. Yeah. Uh, so the other one, I'll just talk briefly about um, our National Science Foundation grant uh, that Char is also involved in. This is an observational grant. This is our first. So the two grants Brian talked about really are development grants for, for the Special Ed uh, Research Accelerator. This is the first um, the grant where we're actually utilizing it solely as a platform. Um, and so we want to, most of what we know about um, education in the, in the United States, at least, but particularly for students with, with disabilities, is kind of anecdotal or it's based off of observational work that's not nationally representative. So we thought that SARA would be a good vehicle to conduct observational studies throughout the country. So this was, ECR is kind of their, their foundational research competition at NSF. So we're conducting a large scale survey and observational study to, to look at science instruction for students with learning disabilities and autism in fourth and fifth grade and how these variables affect science achievement uh, and engagement for these students. Um, so, when we when we went out to to decide to put this this grant together, this is where I, I feel like Sarah really has a lot of power. And we we wanted to go ahead and have these kind of a lot uh, uh, research partners. We wanted to have at least at least one in each U.S. Census district. Uh, we put this out to um, Sarah, and we had interest robust interest in a very short period of time. So over 45 uh, folks ex uh, expressed interest in less than a day. So that shows that there's a desire with our field to engage in this type of work. Um, so we selected 10, we're in all the states that you see here, and actually a couple more since I, since I wrote this slide, including Char there in the state of Utah. And then we used the generalizer, if you're familiar with that, um, 
uh, site in, in order to select schools in order to be in. So we have a generalizable sample of schools that we're going to be collecting this data in. So the ultimate goal here is to have an actually representative sample of uh, observational studies that are collected throughout the country. We're also very open access with this. So if you're familiar with Databrary, um, we're audio recording these, uh, all these sessions. We're going to upload these sessions to Databrary along with all the other information we collect. So not only do we have our own kind of hypotheses and research questions we want to answer, but we're going to have thousands upon thousands upon thousands of hours of audio recording and other data available for folks to utilize in order to answer other questions. And that's another thing I think when, when you think about open science and crowdsourcing is it's not the paper, it's the data. The data that you generate is the most valuable thing. And so you need to make that available as well. I'm going to skip that because I, I want to make sure we get to some questions. Um, so, so we have Sarah and um, I, we were thinking about it with folks that we know, uh, but also our funder kind of said, hey, you know, it's great that you have this special education research accelerated, but is it really crowdsourced research if it's all done at the University of Virginia and you're making all the decisions? And of course not, you know, if it's really going to be democratized research, it needs to be based in the field. Uh, and so we've uh, begun to initiate the, uh, the development of a new 5013C organization, Aletheia Society, and Aletheia means uncovering or truth uh, with um, a, a Greek word. So we formed this new nonprofit. Again, you know, everything that, that we're putting together, we've stolen from other people. So if you know the Society for the Improvement of Psychological Sur uh, uh, Services, right? Sciences. Sciences, thank you. Um, amazing organization. We're kind of modeling uh, uh, Aletheia off of that particular organization. And what it will fall, what we'll do is we'll take Sarah. It will fall under the auspices of this new nonprofit, and then we'll also it'll be it'll be a research organization for special educators and those that are interested in working with individuals with disabilities and that are at risk. We're going to hold unconferences, have a series of action events. And then also, uh, uh, what's relatively new is we're going to have a new open access journal that uh, UVA has agreed to house for us called Research and Special Education RISE. Is there anything you want to add about that, Brian? No, other than you know, RISE will be, um, it, we have a little bit of, of funding uh, or support from the, the university library. So no, uh, no APCs, no article processing charges. Everything's entirely open access. Uh, we're really excited about it, and we're hoping uh, we get some uh, some people who recognize the the benefits of open access. And because um, we're not going to have a journal impact factor to start with, I think we're going to have a, a lot of other benefits. But uh, you know, we're going to need some people to 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 submit. Um, and and I think there'll be we'll do some interesting uh, things uh, to to hopefully in, entice. Uh, people to to put some real good research uh, on the journal, and and so that's um, we're we're hoping to launch that uh, sometime next year. Uh, so so that's in the works too, and and look for more on that. Um, the the last couple of slides, I think we can really kind of skip over, but maybe I'll just when we reflect on it, we think, wow, this was just an idea five years ago, and and uh, you know we're we're so pleased with. Um, the, the collaborations that we've developed and, and we've actually been able to to get some funding to to make all of this a, a reality and and so uh, we're, we're very pleased with with where we're at in in many ways um, but we also recognize that uh, we've got a long way to well, long ways to go and that we have hit a few bumps along the road we're, we're continuing to explore different options for for IRB and and that is not always pleasant uh, trips into the weeds on on that. Uh, it's been a challenge to get into into schools. We're so pleased with the uh, enthusiasm uh, in, in in the field and and just having uh, over 360 research partners. but this relates to the last point. Um, we need to we need to be able to create enough time for ourselves to organize a more distributed, um organizational framework so others we i'm, I'm teaching two classes and I, 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 there's just only so much time in the day and 
we need uh, other uh, people that have talents above and beyond ours. And, and that's the, the notion of crowdsourcing. And, and so we need to bring that to bear uh, to, to get all of this to the next level. Uh, and, and I think that's kind of where we're thinking where we're at. We have a really nice start, but we need other people who are um, you know, motivated and, and uh, have backgrounds and interest in, in this. So with that in mind, uh, there's a, a link here, but it's through the website. You can find it on the website. Email us if, if you have troubles uh, finding that. Um, but we want to continue to grow, and um, we're getting more interest uh, internationally. And as Bill said, we have three uh, federally funded projects, so we've kept it uh, just U.S.-based right now. But we're, we're going to open that up, and um, you know, there might be certain projects that would be based in one region or another, but but there's so many benefits to, to um, broadening our, our uh, connections there. Um, continue to pursue funded projects. We want to um, think about unfunded projects that we can do and do it on the cheap, but with the power of crowdsourcing, we think we can do some really interesting um, things. And we have a few ideas along those lines. And then um, the, the other thing that I've really already covered is developing a governance structure that goes beyond our immediate team because we are um, limited by the, the time constraints that, that uh, a small number of people have, which is, again, exactly back to the point of crowdsourcing to, to utilize that so, so that we can expand and, and, uh, and, and, and do better work. Yeah, so Alethea, we're, we're putting together an uh, initial website for it. It's already a 5013C. Um, we'll be officially launching that this summer. We are looking for um, founding uh, membership partners. It eventually will be a membership organization. So we would love anyone's involvement. Uh, as Brian said, we're you know we are expanding out internationally at this point, certainly with the organization, and we're hopefully with with Sarah as well. So we hope if you're interested in this, that you'll reach out to us and engage in this work and start getting involved in the, uh, in the new nonprofit. So with that, maybe we can open it up for, I know we don't have too much time, but maybe we could open it up for some questions. Or cheers or derision. Yes. I see some great questions popping um, into the Q&A. Uh, the first one is, how do you envision funding to work in the long term? It's a great, a great question. So, um, we, we were fortunate enough to be able to, to get some funds to have a, an actual attorney put together the 5013C. So Alathea should be able to pursue grant funding on its own as an organization with its with its infrastructure. So we hope there'll be some of that funding. Uh, we also want this to be a membership organization. So we kind of see a little bit of funding for folks to join the organization that the that they can harness to, to engage in this work. And then conferences as well. So Primarily on conferences, um, but we could see that as a as a you know primary means to 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 bring in funds into the organization to conduct this this work. So kind of uh, uh, multi pronged. Brian has a dream, and I think it's a wonderful idea of of paying people to review journal articles. Could you imagine that? Even if it was just a little bit of money, or maybe a little bit of a discount on your membership, you know, it's time for us to kind of take over the research enterprise. I mean, it is ours, but yet we seem to, um, you know, outsource and, and provide uh, companies with significant amount of funds. And, and same thing too, as a field of special education, why can't we as an organization decide what grants we want to pursue? And then if you think about the indirect, that money would come back to the nonprofit and be able to, to be used to deploy to do other grant that's, that's not, um, that, that other work that's not grant funded. Excellent. Um, and then maybe one other quick one, and then we'll wrap up. Um, how is the authorship managed? Because you have such huge collaborators and groups. Um, have you worked on that? Yeah, we have a contest, ping pong tournament at, at the uh, end of it. And uh, it, it, it's ordered that way. So if you're going to. Um, no, why can't I think of the acronym? It's a, there's a, credit, it's called the yeah, credit it's taxonomy. Called. So there is a you know, kind of an open process in order to determine the 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 order of authorship um, we're really far behind in this as a field in education if uh, if you look at physics where they do very large group uh, work um, you know it's highly valued to be involved in these kind of larger uh, larger projects so uh, yeah so there are different tiers based off the credit taxonomy and then often within tiers it's it's alphabetized and you know and so 
So depending on whether you're conceptualizing how much you're writing in and such. So that's something, it's a critical question. It needs to be addressed before we get, before we get engaged in this particular work. So everyone feels like their work is valued. I also think, you know, as time goes on, if we think about folks going through promotion and tenure, you could, you could earn certain status within an organization, within a court crowdsource saying what you were involved in and how, you know, what kind of an integral role you played. And to me, that seems like a, a value added for the field because we're actually we're all worried about improving outcomes for students with disabilities, not you know necessarily shining a little light um, over our head for different things that we're engaged in. So we need to find a way to to change the norms within our universities. And again, we're the same people. We are the people that are reviewing everyone's dossiers when they come through. So I think over time we can do that. And the credit taxonomy involves you get basically um, hyperscripts. Um, and so there are predetermined um, uh, contributions that you could make to an article, whether that is collecting data, analyzing uh, the, the data, writing up the study, conceptualizing the study, and you would get um, different um, hyperscript, you know, one, two, and six after your name. And, and uh, you would be put in a, a tier of authorship depending on, on kind of a predetermined prioritization. Um, uh, about that. Daria, you've got some great questions there, and I'm going to, um, we don't have time, but um, maybe I can uh, copy those and, and try to respond. But but just real quickly, we don't charge anyone to um, participate in a SARA study. And it is one of the things um, in our in our funded studies, we're able to, to um, provide some financial support um, uh, and, and an honorarium to uh, research partners to participate, but we'd also like to expand just to broaden the involvement in, in some of our projects to things that people don't get paid for, and so it wouldn't be uh, that the time commitment wouldn't be as significant. But but that can people could do a, a small piece of some things. We're, we're thinking, for example, of um, doing a, a true experiment with random. Uh, random assignment to uh, post work as, as a preprint or not, and then look over time uh, the effects that have on um, presence in on social media and citations and things like that. That would be a, a fairly small lift, but we could get tons of different people in, involved. And I think it could be quite a powerful study that wouldn't cost anything. But no, we haven't. We're, I, we, I think we want to avoid ever charging anyone to, to participate in, in a SARA study. Well, I'd like to give a huge thanks to our wonderful panelists today, Brian, Bill, and Char. Um, also, thank you to all of you for joining us and being so active in the chat. It's been a really fun time today. It was wonderful to hear about where the idea for the Sarah Project stemmed from, key research, and some really innovative ideas. I have like 20 questions that I need to follow up with you all about. Um, it's just been an exciting time, and we thank you very much for your time today, and have a great week, everyone.